Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hi. My name is Mike. This is Caroline. We are excited to be part of this summit. Uh, we've had a great time. We've enjoyed a number of the sessions, and we think that you are absolutely on the right track. And uh, a lot of the topics and criteria that you're talking about uh, are going to come through today uh, in our session. We are embracing this year's revolutionary theme by throwing away our PowerPoint. Okay, so yay! I will still be saying click, click a few times uh, throughout the presentation, but instead we'll be using the services of Allegra Keith uh, from Momentum Inc. She is our live graphic illustrator today, and she'll be bringing some of the concepts that we have to talk about to life. Okay, so thank you very much, Alive Rob. The topic of today's session is 2030, and uh, as we prepare uh, for this journey to 2030, I want to uh, go through uh, the basic planning process for the session. First, we're going to talk a little bit about adventure travel. Uh, today and some of the things that we believe you have going for it uh, and uh, that'll work well for you in the year 2030. After that, we will uh, begin to set the stage by giving you a number of facts and figures about 2030 so you can start to imagine what it will be like uh, in the far off future. Then we'll go and talk about three basic themes that we think are most important uh, to highlight and underline for this group. And once we have those themes set, uh, we will move to uh, add characters uh, to each of those themes uh, to make it come alive for you. Okay. So, 2030. It looks, a, it looks a little far off, a little hazy, a little hard to imagine. And so what I'd like all of us to do is a bit of a mind exercise first. And instead of going 15 years forward, let's go 15 years backwards. Okay. So close your eyes with me for a second, and stay awake. <laughs> it's 1999, and you are planning for this trip, okay? You've just opened up a Snapple, <coughs> and you're, you're drinking it. Uh, you're maybe a little young, you're obviously younger, you're maybe a little thinner, you're a little cooler. Um, and you go online for a second. And you hear that horrible noise because you have dial-up. <laughs> and maybe you go to Google. It's only two years old. And maybe you used to ask Jeeves. Um, maybe you went to TripAdvisor, which was missing a key component of TripAdvisor, namely 250 million reviews. Um, what else did you have to do to prepare for that trip? Well, you might have had to order some traveler's checks. Uh, maybe you had to pick up the phone and actually call for your airline tickets. Maybe you had to use a fax machine. Um, I hope all of you were listening to Mambo number no. 5 <laughs> while you did that. Um, either way, uh, there were whispers of what 2015 might look like back then. Um, but certain whispers uh, faded away, and others boomed into loud voices for today. And as you think about 2030 moving forward, I think you'll start to understand that a lot of the topics that you've been talking about and concepts that we discussed today are whispers. They are here, um, but they will be expanded upon in the future. Caroline, uh, perhaps you can talk to us. Uh, throughout this session, I'll be going a little more broad, and Caroline will be focusing on uh, the travel and tourism aspect. So, Carolyn, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, how travel has evolved over the years? Yeah, sure, definitely. I mean, when we look back 50 years, um, travel was very much just for the rich, for the elite. Then we had the boom of the package holidays in the 1950s, followed by the emergence of independent travel and adventure travel in the 60s. When you look at the 90s, there was mass disruption. There was the online revolution. We saw low-cost carriers opening up the world to the masses. So travel has been really democratized. It's no longer the preserve of the rich or the famous. And we saw during the global economic crisis that travel and holidays were very much protected by consumers in times of austerity. It really was one of the last household items that they would give up. 
We also know that consumers really value experiences. Recent Euro neuroscience research from Cornell shows that experiences make us happier. So you can't get more ex experiences than adventure travel. It really is very experiential. And you can't get more responsible than responsible, uh, adventure travel. You guys, your average uh, tourist spends $3,000 in the destination, and they spend longer in destination than their mass market counterparts. So you really are in a great position. Yeah, and something you should be quite proud of is that 66% um, of the dollars that people spend on adventure travel stay within a local economy. 10% of money spent in mass travel stays within a local economy. So you truly are local. As I think about a number of the terms that um, I've heard in different sessions here this week, uh, ethical, sustainable, local, I'm reminded that in my business, I look across industries and geographies. And what comes to light is that different trends manifest themselves in different ways uh, at different times across industries and countries. So, uh, for example, uh, let's take the alcoholic drink sector. Uh, some of the same concepts that you've been talking about here have actually uh, created quite a boom in beer over the last five years. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the craft brew uh, boom in the United States, which is also starting to take off in China, Japan, New Zealand, and other places. Um, what are they focused on? They're focused on quality. Uh, they're talk focused on premium ingredients. They're, they're focused on local. And they have actually uh, changed a fairly stagnant industry uh, and forced uh, the entire industry to take a new look at how it creates its product. This also reminds me a little bit of the early 2000s and the uh, natural foods uh, boom, uh, or the organic foods boom. And um, basically what happens in industries is you have this period of disruption where you have a, a smaller a group of the industry uh, that is passionate and brings some sort of new technology or new thinking or new product to the fore. After that, there is a period of mess. Okay? Definitions are confusing. There's no accreditation. There's no certification. The boundaries are, are, are sloppy, and it causes confusion within, in, within the industry. Okay? After a period where uh, organizations like yourself, associations, work with governments and other businesses to start to tighten up those definitions and ensure that the consumer trusts what is organic, or trusts what is natural, or trusts what is local or sustainable. Only at that time can the industry truly take the next step. And this can take five, 10 years to actually get to those points. The companies that seem to do best in this space do three basic things that I think this group should understand. One is they are steadfast in their mission. They know what they believe in and they stand and they say it proudly and clearly and steadfastly. Number two, they have an intimate relationship with their consumers. I know most of you already have this. They can intuit what their needs are today and tomorrow. And the third thing, the businesses that succeed in this space this time of mess uh, do well, is they actually use the magic triangle that uh, Tim talked about yesterday. They're confident enough to engage with the broader industry, to engage with governments, and make sure that their story, their ideas, are the path forward for the future. Um, so I think that probably works best uh, for this group as it looks to move forward. Yeah. Definitely agree, Mike. We're at a crossroads. When you look at the broader consumer trends in the macroeconomic environment, we've got demographic shifts, we've got technology, we've got geopolitical concerns and threats. We're really seeing a lot of disruption, particularly driven by new tech. We've got the rise of the sharing economy in the last several years. We've also got the, state, the state's status where we have the mass market competing with the specialists and the niche. You know, it's becoming ever more difficult to distinguish between these brands. 
For example, you can now fly from the UK to Costa Rica with TUI. You know, this is uh, Europe's leading tour operator. They now offer you know, Costa Rica a very sustainable destination. TUI has its travel life brand. Um, basically, they offer tours and activities with an adventure focus. And this is all at the same price point as Intrepid. So it's becoming more difficult to uh, have that point of differentiation. What do you do? So I've talked a little bit about adventure tourism. We're 10 minutes into a presentation about 2030. Let's get weird for a minute. Uh, Caroline, let's talk about, you know, when I think of it, uh, the future of travel, maybe I think of total recall. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, space travel. Is, is that the future of adventure? I think we have to look to Casey yeah. for, for his space travel. <laughs> But definitely, what well, we're expecting um, suborbital flights definitely will be coming in. Uh, they'll be very much the, uh, sort of for the rich and famous to begin with. But yes, post 2030, they definitely could be a reality for some of the more uh, adventurous uh, travelers of us. But I think what's more transformational are the supersonic flights. They're expected to take off and be mainstream by 2025. This is where you're going to be able to travel at the speed of sound you'll be able to open up destinations, far-flung countries like uh, in Latin America, Australasia, to new source markets. That's going to be really revolutionary. So we've got supersonic, we've got the hyperloop that uh, Elon Musk is uh, looking at. So this desire by humanity to, to always go faster, more efficient, more fuel efficient, and also just to generally get there quicker. So I think, Mike, you'll particularly like this one. I've been on panels um, such as World Travel Market, and futurologists have predicted that teleportation is also going to be a reality within the next 100 years. So, what do you reckon? <laughs> uh, I'm not ready to be beamed up, I don't think, um, just yet. But yeah, exciting stuff. Um, there's other things out there uh, that are certainly uh, focused on technology and it'll push on travel and, and uh, tourism in general. Uh, artificial intelligence is one, uh, virtual reality is another, and certainly uh, the advanced use of biometrics. So, artificial intelligence, we already have things like bottlers that will bring a drink to your room uh, if you press the right call button. Um, yeah, exciting times, maybe two drinks. Um, we also have uh, virtual reality. Uh, you know, we have things like uh, Facebook buying uh, these huge masks like Oculus Rift, yeah? and uh, investing in that, it's a sure sign that that is going to take off. And, and a lot like a lot of the films uh, that we've watched here today, I believe that a virtual reality will probably have its greatest uh, impact in storytelling and allowing adventurers to get a feel for what a place or a space is like before they buy. Biometrics is another area that's likely to speed up uh, some of the logistics issues with transportation. Uh, we have things like fingerprint and facial recognition. They're going to make uh, travel a little more seamless, a little more integrated, and a little faster. Uh, so maybe the future of travel will be uh, smaller queues in, in an airport. Um, we also have to take a moment to say that as we think about scenario planning and, and look to the future and, and what is going to succeed and fail, it is worth noting that things like war, uh, things like regional pandemics are real, uh, they are unpredictable, and um, they will have an impact on tomorrow that is uh, that we are unable to really identify uh, other than to say that they are uh, likely to be there and something we'll have to continue to work with and around. So, we have talked a little bit about 2030. Now let's give you some facts and figures uh, to help set the stage. Okay? So, 2030, um, we are going to be bigger as a group. Okay? Today we have about 7.3 billion people on the planet. By 2030, we'll have 8.4 billion people. So there'll be 1 billion more of us. That's a lot. We will be living in cities. Today about 54% of us live in an urban area. By 2030 that number will jump to 60%. By 2050 that number will actually jump to 
People will go where the jobs are, and the jobs tend to be in major metropolitan areas. The good news for this group is so will all the stress, so will all the congestion. They will be looking to get away from those moments. So we'll be, there'll be more of us, we'll be living in cities, and we will also be older, okay? The baby boomers, uh, this huge uh, piece of the population will slowly be moving uh, into uh, advanced ages, okay? So the average age uh, of the world today is 32 years. By 2030, that number will jump to 35 years. And it's not just a Western thing. Uh, the average age of an individual in China in 2030 will be 45 years of age. Okay. So the baby boomers are, are moving along. Who replaces them? Millennials. How many millennials do we have here? Uh, were you born after 1980 and before 1996? Yeah, okay. Yes, you're a social group. You want things now. Yeah, very good. Uh, certainly millennials also crave adventure. There'll be three billion of, it, of the eight billion, so three billion millennials in 2030. Uh, they will be the main focus of the travel and tourism industry. Uh, also, uh, the children uh, that follow millennials, uh, we have Generation Z, uh, born after 2000, and then we have uh, Generation Alpha. Uh, so if any of you have toddlers in the room, they are a part of Generation Alpha. They will be fully immersed in technology, will be native technology users, yes? They will actually not understand the difference between online and offline. It's irrelevant to them. I can tell you, having a one-year-old that already knows how to find photos of herself on my phone suggests this is a reality. Um, so certainly these generations uh, are going to demand that you have a mobile platform uh, that is clear and simple and integrated with your offline <coughs> activities. Okay, so that's a little bit about the people. Now let's talk about technology. There are many, many numbers that we could talk about with technology, but there's really just one that I think tells the story for you. Today, 40% of the population has a smartphone. By 2030, that number will jump to 80%. Worldwide, that's a global number. 80% of the population will have access to a smartphone per capita term. Finally, another exciting thing for you is income. And this is where the East really starts to come into play. Um, in order to go abroad, to take a trip, uh, the average family needs to make about 35,000 US dollars, okay? Today, um, the number of people that earn that much money that can travel abroad, it's about 600 million people that can do that. 600 million, okay? Uh, households, excuse me. Uh, in 2030, that number will be 1.2 billion. It will also double, okay? So we're getting older, there's more of us, and there's huge demand for uh, global travel coming. That's right, and, and what we've seen is that travel is um, one of the industries that outperforms the global economy. Okay, we had the global economic crisis and uh, the, the industry declined, but it bounced back. We saw that there was great resilience. Also, the importance of travel is being recognized across the world. Governments are increasingly seeing it as a pillar of their economies, a way to diversify. And also, more importantly, it is a great job creator. So currently, the WTTC say that uh, one in 11 jobs around the world is accounted for indirectly or directly by travel and tourism. Based on our projections, we think this could go up to one in nine jobs. You really are a very important part of the world and, and creating great opportunities for people. But there's also this responsibility. We need to continue to invest in the industry and particularly in infrastructure. So McKinsey say that you need, we need to be spending about $57 trillion, that's an enormous amount of money, on infrastructure, so roads, rail, seaports, the list goes on. When you look at the number of airports under construction at the moment, it is 2,000. 
So 60 of those alone are in China. We're already traveling a lot. We've crossed the billion mark for international outbound trips. 1.2 billion trips will be taken this year. By 2030, that definitely could almost reach 2 billion. Now we mustn't forget domestic tourism. It's also the backbone of many economies. So when you look at the volume of domestic trips, 9 billion, this is based on your amount of research across the world. And that could also, even at a slower pace of growth, double. So we really have enormous demand coming, but we also need to make sure it's managed sustainably and it's done in a very safe and efficient way. Yeah, and speaking of safety, uh, certainly um, we recently did a white paper with Microsoft on cybersecurity and uh, sitting through Scott's session yesterday on the use of big data and uh, just understanding that the consumer of tomorrow will be very comfortable giving a lot more of themselves um, to the world uh, so that they can receive more customized uh, information and services back. Uh, it is extremely important um, that uh, security measures are taken and a lot of the scenarios that we run uh, look to make sure uh, that people's identities and uh, content is actually protected and organizations like yourself have to be at the forefront of that concept as well. So now that we've sort of set the stage for 2030, and if we were to make it very simple for you, I think it's, there is huge opportunity coming and many, many more people uh, traveling, double the amount of people traveling. Let's talk about uh, three basic themes today. First is the adventure traveler of tomorrow. Our second major theme will be the hyper-connected traveler. And our third theme will be the mindful traveler. So let's start with the adventure traveler of tomorrow. We've already basically described that the middle class will double uh, and that uh, the number of households that will grow will be primarily coming from uh, Eastern <coughs> countries. Uh, that does not mean that the US and Western Europe are not going to still be important parts of travel. They absolutely will. Uh, we are also getting older. Okay, So how does this industry uh, react to uh, the year 2030, when the average baby boomer is 84 years old. Okay. Guess what? They are still going to want to go on adventure travel trips. Yeah? Because they're loud and they always want to do stuff all the time. Yes, they'll still want it. Um, but you're going to have to accommodate their needs. It's going to have to be shorter. Uh, likely going to have to have more dietary and medical assistance associated with it. Yes? That's the so what here you need to react to how your consumers are going to change. And consumers, as uh, Mike said, the, the, the changing face of consumers, we're going to see much more emerging market travelers, so much more ethnically diverse mix. So coming from Latin America, from Asia, from even Africa that holds great potential. So it's really important to get to know these travelers and also make sure that you accommodate for them, for their preferences. What do they value most? When you look at the, the emerging markets, there's been so much talk about the BRICS over the past 15 years. It's like, okay, beyond BRICS, where do we look? But the volume, the sheer volume and the potential that they offer is enormous. When you look at China, 70 million outbound trips taken internationally. Okay, most of it is to Hong Kong or to inter-Asia, inter inter -Asia. but you know, the, there's still more and more Chinese travelers coming across to other parts of the world. By 2030, there'll be 130 million outbound Chinese trips. They're going to overtake the US, they're going to overtake Germany, they're even going to overtake the UK. They're going to be the number one source of international tourism demand. It's time we got to know them a little bit better. No doubt. And that definitely looks like uh, my grandma, by the way, <laughs> for sure. Uh, if we now move to the hyper-connected theme, um, consumers are going to demand uh, that you are interacting with them on a regular basis via some sort of mobile technology. The rate of change in that industry is dramatic. We talked a little bit about Google in 1998, Facebook in 2004, the iPhone only came out in 2007. We had things like uh, Instagram, Uber, Airbnb. Um, now, uh, even more recently, 
Uh, we have things like Fitbit and, and smart, uh, you know, uh, Apple Watches. Who has a Fitbit here in the audience? Anybody? Yeah, certainly a trend we'll talk about a little more. I actually swallowed mine, um, part of the ingestion, uh, ingestionable, uh, you know, future. Uh, so it looks like I had a good night's sleep last night, though, all the same. So definitely, the, we're going to see um, increased sort of uh, the sort of the need to understand your consumers. There's a lot of disruption, um, but some things are going to remain uh, steadfast and solid. Consumers will still look to brands uh, that they trust. They will value convenience, flexibility, and value for money. And all this will be powered by technology. So what we're seeing is this mass movement towards mobile. And that means that consumers are always on, they're always connected, and they expect brands to be there 24-7. We're moving to an era of one brand, one person, and that's basically what we're moving to, complete personalization in the future. And that means hyper-transparency is required. That means that communication uh, with a consumer on their terms is required. Getting to know them is required. Um, we're not saying that offline transactions are going away. That's really not the case. Uh, there will be offline transactions in 2030, but the consumer will expect that around that offline transaction, you are immersing them in an experience, a technological experience that complements it, supplements it, enhances it in a way uh, that allows them to share that experience freely with their friends, with their family, with their other businesses that they deem important to themselves. And that brings us nicely to our third theme, which is the mindful traveler. We know that there's a sea change happening. We've just seen the ratification of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Things are moving in the right direction. We have COP21 in Paris in the next few months with the hopes of a global compact on, environment, on the environment and climate, climate change. So we definitely feel you guys, you have sustainability, responsible travel at your core and things are moving in the right direction on an industry, a business and also on a consumer level. We talk a little bit about Fitbit, and uh, that is a technology that um, you wear on your wrist, and then basically it'll track uh, your heart rate, it'll track the way you sleep, it'll track a number of uh, biometrics about yourself. And you can use that in a sort of a gamification approach to uh, benchmark uh, amongst your friends or other people that are your age or have a similar lifestyle to you. This concept, I really think, is just the beginning of where people will go. They certainly want more information. They want more data about themselves so they can make better, smarter choices. What if tomorrow, in 2030, we had something called a kind bit that tracked not only oneself, but their impact on the environment? What if it measured how long your shower was this morning? What if it measured the carbon footprint that you emitted on a daily basis when you drove to work in your VW? Uh, yeah, yeah. VW is a great example of this transparency thing we're talking about. Brand and company, forget about it. It's one thing. Those individuals at that company matter. It's why you guys have an immense amount of power, because as an individual group, what we've watched about is that you have a clarity of purpose that needs to come through and stand loud and proud in the industry. Anyways, uh, yeah, this kind of concept, I think, really suggests uh, what's, what's uh, possible for tomorrow and how tomorrow's consumer will interact with their environment. Okay? And uh, certainly it would be nice if that device was sponsored by the ATTA. <laughs> Should we switch gears now? Uh, we've sort of set the stage with three basic themes, yeah? So we gave you some demographic information to understand 2030. We've set three themes, and now you're going to meet some characters uh, that make those themes come to life. So the first character in our story is uh, Zhang Wei. He is from China. He's about 35 years old in 2030. 
He is married and has a two-year-old. He uh, also has a uh, manufacturing job in Shanghai. He's a passionate cyclist. He loves cycling. He took a trip uh, uh, in northern China about two years ago on a cycling adventure. And via a shared CRM system, he got a push notification about a salted bike tour here in Argentina and Chile. And he is, well, has been thrilled about it ever since. As uh, he and his wife uh, start to plan for this trip, they start a WeChat group. Um, they look up on the website and they try to find uh, operators that have Mandarin web pages um, because they feel more comfortable with that. They've gotten comfortable traveling abroad, but they tend to do, they've tended to do it in group settings before. So they went to Europe last year as part of a tour. Uh, but this time they're going to go independently and they're going to take an Airbus 400 uh, low-cost, uh, long-haul flight for only 500 U.S. dollars a person. It's important to get to know Zheng Wei. Uh, as I said, China's going to be the leading outbound source of tourism demand by 2030. Already, they're their largest spending outbound nation. They spend $180 billion a year on travel. That's outside of their country. Uh, it's really important to get to know what matters to them. Um, Asian consumers really sort of uh, prioritize values, uh, tradition, and heritage. It's really very important to them. Also, when you look at uh, sort of attracting uh, emerging markets to your destination, uh, the process of uh, access to the country also needs to be improved. So, looking at visa facilitation, you know, proving, sort of setting up visa waiver programs, setting up visas upon, upon arrival. When you look at uh, emerging markets as well, they have different priorities for their spending. Uh, take the top three international source markets of the UK, uh, US and Germany. Their priority, number one, after transport is lodging, then they have food, and then it's uh, shopping. When you look at uh, consumer markets like China, the number one priority is shopping. They spend $50 billion a year already on international shopping. So they've got shopping, food, and then activities. So again, very good for this group. Uh, but also some things are sort of universal. So food is number two in both, both uh, sets of markets. Food is universal. Yes. Um, there's no doubt that um, you have to be ready for Zhang Wei and his wife. Uh, how do you blend uh, the idea of luxury shopping uh, with sustainable adventure? Uh, do you actually develop uh, a list of local uh, suppliers of clothing and other uh, art, uh, perhaps wine in Argentina, uh, that you can actually incorporate into a local sustainable capsule uh, that Jane Williams' wife might want to purchase? Can you uh, find ways to ensure that you uh, accept China Union Pay, which is the only credit card that he and his wife utilize when they travel? Are you going to make sure uh, that you uh, have a Jingtao beer afterwards so that when they finish that big trip, he feels uh, welcomed in his new place? There's a lot to think about. Um, and, and certainly a lot of opportunity uh, as the number of Chinese travelers abroad will be immense. <clears throat> Let's now meet Sana. Sana is 27. She lives in Bangalore, India. She is an IT consultant. She's traveled abroad uh, for study in Europe uh, earlier in her life, but she's now come back to Bangalore uh, to start a career. She's recently married. There were over 600 people at her wedding one month ago. Her mom is already asking her when her grandchildren will be arriving. Because no matter how far we forecast in the future, some things always stay the same. Sana's connected 24-7. Sana has 2 million followers on Instagram. Sana sometimes hires out a drone to follow her around so that she can v-blog video about how awesome her life is. 
Sana is married to Raj, and Raj accepts that Sana is consistently, constantly connected. Sana's clothing tracks her every movement. Her shoes track her every movement. Her contact lenses uh, are also uh, formatted to uh, utilize a web technology. Raj just wants to get away a little bit, and he's actually uh, talked her into going to the Himalayas to a spa that actually blocks Wi-Fi. <laughs> Young love is a beautiful thing. <laughs> Compromise is possible. Sana thinks this sounds like hell. <laughs> but she's willing to try it even though she suffers from what the industry calls nomophobia. Nomophobia. There it is. Nomophobia. Yeah. So yeah, Sana, she's a fascinating character, but there's going to be 80% of the world like her. They're going to be connected to a smartphone. And it's really important to have a sort of mobile-enabled website. Uh, we're not saying ditch your website, but we're saying just make sure you've got that, your, that ability to reach people uh, who are accessing information through their smartphones, or in the case of Sana, through her wearable contact lenses. You know, we know that the Apple Watch is coming in, um, you know, people are going to be, there's going to be so many different devices that they can access the internet. So really, uh, we could have ubiquitous connectivity if Mark Zuckerberg has his way, with all those sort of satellites he's going to put up over Africa. But uh, yeah, the thing is to ensure that Wi-Fi is no longer a perk. You know, we have to ask, do we really need to pay for Wi-Fi these days? In 2030, it's just going to be a given. You need to provide it. So also the fact that uh, we have to make sure that we've got uh, this, also the, you can take advantage of the fact that they're constantly connected. You can make sure that you can push information to them, particularly in destination. So we're gonna see already today that consumers in India and China, they find targeted ads and notifications really helpful. So 40% already say it's acceptable. So things are changing. Absolutely. And I love the moon selfie that Sana's taking. We'll come back to Sana in a minute, but let's introduce her third character, uh, and that is Maria from Santiago, not too far away. She's 55 years old. Uh, she has two uh, grown children, and she uh, is um, our mindful traveler. She actually only selects travel destinations and operators um, that uh, have an affiliation or are associated with uh, Amnesty International's uh, approved uh, partner site. She has a passion for going to see uh, Africa's Big Five, um, but because of some restrictions and limitations and lists, she's on a number of waiting lists at the moment. So instead, she chooses to see the migration of wildebeest via her Oculus Rift. Yeah, she actually gets to ride one of them. And um, <laughs> she uh, instead often chooses domestic travel. You know, part of that 18 billion domestic travel uh, trips that are going to be taken in 2030, she, she takes a lot of them uh, because they offer a, a better uh, carbon footprint for tomorrow. She is our mindful traveler. Yes, and for, for Maria, um, there's going to be increasingly difficult choices to make about where she goes on holiday. Basically, there are going to be ever greater sort of restrictions, uh, quotas, even bans. You know, we could potentially face some large-scale bans in the travel industry as governments, local uh, governments, see that they have to protect their destinations um, and preserve their cultural and natural heritage. So it's going to become increasingly difficult to make a, that decision about where to go on holiday. Um, and I think what we'll see is more and more people looking for guidance about where to, what is a responsible destination as opposed to uh, a less responsible destination. Yeah, and perhaps uh, one of those local trips that Maria takes is the Atacama Desert up north in Chile, a beautiful place. She may go see the salt flats there, and she may uh, rent a driverless car uh, to go do that. 
Yeah, she may actually uh, share that driverless car with two other people to pay for part of her trip. And she's going to do a homestay uh, while she is up in that part of the north. She will not use Airbnb because that will feel too commercial. <laughs> Instead, she will use some sort of micro-platform, sustainable site uh, that allows her to have uh, a local experience that ensures that every dollar she spends in that space stays in that space. Yeah, I think we see the sharing economies sort of emerge from nowhere. You know, as Mike said, Airbnb came about sort of 2008. We have now have Uber. These are like global, globally recognized brands. Uh, the sharing economy, uh, when it's sort of done in a sort of uh, in responsible way, really does empower the local communities. So the fact that Maria will be able to go and share uh, and stay with a local uh, lady or, or family in, in the Atacama Desert, and the, it's, a, it's an additional revenue stream for that family. It's really empowering. Um, the other thing about the sharing economy, they've, they've grown so dramatically. Um, they've you know, got to global scale very, very quickly. And it's all thanks to technology. When you look uh, at Uber, for example, a very controversial brand that's trying to be stamped out because it's upsetting the local taxi uh, drivers. But if you look at the technology itself, it's very powerful. So they have the supply and demand mapping algorithm and they're now, with their Uber pool, uh, trying to reduce the number of cars on the road. So it's a dramatic reduction that they're aiming for, it's something like over 60-70%. As we start to come to a close here, there were two other pieces of information, you started just to touch on them, uh, a little bit about um, the income gap uh, between genders and also a little bit more about cities um, that I think will help round out 2030. As we looked at the numbers uh, about 2030, something that struck me was that um, in the West, the income gap between men and women is continuing to shrink. Uh, but the Eastern markets are growing at a faster rate of pace, and there, the income gap is much wider. So actually, by 2030, the income gap between men and women will have grown uh, by 5,000 US dollars. I do think that people in this room, uh, via some of the uh, topics that have come up today, have the opportunity to help reduce that at the global level over time and look to empower women. Additionally, let's not forget about 70% of the population living in uh, cities and uh, wanting to experience adventure travel in a real way, but a much shorter uh, time frame. So, uh, micro adventure and uh, urban adventure needs to be a part uh, of the planning here, and certainly we've heard it is. Um, I think the, uh, the session uh, on passion earlier this week sort of highlighted the importance of, of that concept. Yeah, definitely we feel that the, you know, for people like Sana who are looking for sort of a, an afternoon of adventure, um, where she could maybe just go down the street and, you know, go to her local sort of vertical farm and do a sort of farm-to-table experience. It's really important to offer that uh, opportunity. And also another way to get to know your clients as well in their urban environment. Because 70% of them are going to live in urban areas. We also have, you know, cities making enormous strides to become ever more smarter, sustainable. Lots of indices of saying, oh, Frankfurt is the number one green city in the world. So it's definitely, there is a, a sea change and a mindset change uh, within the urban environment. When you look at cities like London, there's a very interesting crowdfunded campaign going on at the moment to make London the first national city park. So those of us that know London really well, you're like, really? But this is like this movement, uh, this grand swell by residents to ensure that they protect green space so that they can share this natural habitat with the future generations and ensure that they protect biodiversity. Yeah, and as this flexibility of, you know, maybe let's go back to Sana for a second. Uh, in IT, maybe she has flex hours with Raj and they, they actually work in a group space. Um, maybe their idea of adventure is that they go to a vertical farm uh, down the street and they actually do some farming for the afternoon and they actually have a real farm-to-table experience where they, they then have a professional chef uh, cook that meal for them later that night. 
I'm sure she'll be blog about it as well. <laughs> um, we hope that talking about some of these big concepts today, that these characters help articulate what they are. And we also hope that, and you're probably not surprised, that some of the whispers and ideas uh, that have been mentioned throughout this week are the same ones that we're looking at in 2030. They are just going to be amplified in different ways. So as we wrap up, we wanted to leave you with three basic concepts, uh, specifically for the ATTA, uh, that we think are most important uh, to remember and recognize in 2030. Uh, first is your consumer. Your consumer in 2030 is going to be rapidly shifting. They're going to be getting slightly older. They're definitely going to be tilting to the east. You need to embrace this, and you need to figure out ways to communicate with that individual on an intimate level. In terms of values, we're, we need to kind of break out of the silos. We're seeing the mass market embracing sustainable principles. Responsible travel is now for all. And we feel that there's so much collective will and passion about responsible travel in this group that you have this opportunity, an amazing chance to lead by example. Third, you're already part of a revolution this week and you're beginning to think big for next year. Um, you need to be loud, stand strong and steadfastly in what you believe and speak it uh, loudly to the industry. Help build guidelines, help build certifications, help some of the fuzziness that's within this industry uh, go away and bend the industry to your beliefs, to your future. We'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on 2030 today and uh, we wish you great success uh, as you wrap up uh, today's session.